any trade magazine you read or you know home magazines for example the highest return on investment for single family residential has always been the kitchen and bathroom there right? you go always and and yeah. they actually Lindsay's did. like got her hands up in the yeah. air Okay guys, so we'll get started again here. So Bob Lyons here is an absolute monster. I'll get into a bit of our background how we know each other. Um, he owns RJ Lyons appraisals. He's been at it for 30 years. I'd say they probably do what, over 5,000 appraisals a year when things are kind of a normal time. 5,000 appraisals a year. You think about that, you've seen this many properties and your team's really in the trenches doing the work. You know, you're data heavy when it comes to understanding what's happening in the marketplace. You're a guy I lean on a lot when it comes to appraisals. Um, first question I have before we get into it is how did you even get started in the appraisal business and end up here? That's a good question, Justin. I, I kind of fell into this business actually. Uh, I always had a very strong interest in real estate. And there was a program called uh, Urban Affairs and Real Estate at Fanshawe College they had. And you could learn appraisal theory and assessment theory. Okay. I actually had a short stint at MPAC as well, which is assessment based stuff. But the appraisal, the appraisal gig is what I'm a numbers guy. I've always liked valuation tools. Um, and that's essentially what appraising is. Yeah. And uh, I took that two year program. I graduated in uh, January of 88. And I started with an appraisal firm in London. And uh, literally right out of college and uh, never looked back. Here we are 32 years later. So when did you start working at Joe Cools? Joe Cools was an interim. Uh, you and I, that's where you that's and I met, right. of course. And, yeah. uh, you know, that was uh, when I first started out. Back in those days, it was actually 85 to 88 I worked at Cools. Wow. And uh, you had to, back when I first started for a gentleman named Drew Edgerton, you had to get your own business. Okay. So you learned for $250 a week 100%. To, to, to trade. Then it was up to you to develop your own business. And if you, you either sunk or swam. You're getting clients, you know, getting. Yeah. I, I mean, so, your business. So Joe Cools is yeah. what helped me. Survive. Literally. You know everybody, because, right? Because initially you didn't have any money, you weren't yeah. making any money, you had to go get your own customers, et cetera, et cetera. So super interesting. I worked for Cools for about six more months, and then I was so busy, yeah, with with appraisal work that I was I had to leave. Right? So Joe Cools, for those of you that aren't local to London, Ontario, is a institution. Um, I spent close to a decade there. Mike Smith actually taught me a ton when it comes to how we actually do our business here. I mean, it really became a connection point within the community, right? So I'm sure, yeah. like. We, we've had so many conversations about people that we know that we've worked together with, like layovers that were there when you were there, that were there when I was there. And I mean, we even do our lunches at the Run Club. So shout out to yeah, Mike Smith yeah. and everybody too. I know you guys hold a very warm place in our hearts, right? Yeah, we have to thank Mike for all he's taught us actually because it was invaluable the experience we learned from Mike for sure. And it's, it's funny because I was talking to him about what's happening during COVID. So obviously Mike being a guy that I respect a lot and I consider him almost like a second father, I called him to see how they were doing because they're in the restaurant industry, which is obviously taking a beating with what's going on in COVID, but yeah. they adapt, right? They started an online grocery delivery company. Um, they really started finding different ways. And Mike's always been a guy to keep his people employed. Um, I guess let's jump right into that. When COVID happened, what happened in your world? Did you guys stop doing appraisals altogether? Because the bank was still issuing mortgages. So I'm assuming yeah. stuff still had to be done, right? Yeah, yeah. It really just changed for us. We had to we had to adapt like everybody else. Yeah. Uh, you know, fortunately for us, we haven't been hit as hard as some industries, but uh, we were down a good 30% one month, but then it, it started to come back. But in those initial months, there was all kinds of changes. We had to literally adapt. We had to move everybody home for mm -hmm. safety reasons. We had to... Uh, uh, readjust entirely to how we inspect properties too because you had to respect the people in their homes and their families. Yep. So we literally had to come up with a new way to appraise homes in this environment. Sure. And that was actually really difficult because how are we going to appraise the home without seeing the home? So let's strip that down. Before COVID, how do you appraise a house? Well, appraising a house is it's pretty straightforward. We there's two two processes. We we set up an appointment with the customer. So I would call you, for example, sure. and I say, Justin, it's Bob calling from Marjorie Lands Real Estate Appraisers. We'd like to set up a time with you to come and appraise your home for the lender. Uh, we we'd in fact do that, set that up. I would show up at your home. Yeah. 
and we would literally walk through the property with you. So we would start in the basement typically and walk to the basement, main, upper. And, and, and you know, in, in that inspection process, that's where we get a feel for the level and nature of the property improvements. And the, the whole reason we inspect a home is to get a feel for the home and the level and the nature of the improvements in the home. Compared to other inventory on the marketplace? Exactly. So now that we've got a good feel for the home and the level of care and maintenance it's received or commercially lack thereof. Yeah. Deferred which, maintenance, which is which, the polite way of saying you don't take care of your stuff. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And a lot of people want to say because they don't want us to see the deferred maintenance. Yeah. <laughs> but it's okay. Hey, if your kids have toys and Legos on the ground, that's an okay thing. It's more like it's, the actual wear and tear. But it's funny you say that because yeah. people worry about that. They say, oh, I'm so sorry about the mess. And that's please don't. Well, don't worry, we look beyond that. We're not here to, to value your housekeeping. We're here to look at the <laughs> property, right? So long story short, that's how yeah. we get a feel for the home, the level of nature, the improvements. Now we're equipped. And everybody always say to me when I'm leaving, say, so Bob, what's it worth? What's and I said, well, it's not that simple. That, that was easy. You got it. Eh? <laughs> no, I'm not done. I'm just getting started. Sure. So now I've, now I've got a feel for your home and, and, and the level of nature groups, as we said. Now I can go back to the office and we literally try to find the best substitutes for the home or property that have sold recently. Okay. And we'll set those properties up in a grid next to the subject property and we will adjust for differences, literally. Mm. So that's kind of in a nutshell, the appraisal process. And it's, it's that research and finding the best substitutes is very, very important, which is why we spend so much time at home. And it, it makes sense, right? You physically have to see something to assess it. I, it's kind of the same in the real estate world. I always tell people when I go to listing appointments, we've been through this together, where I'll go in and tell people, I'm not giving you a price today. Yeah, you and, can. and it drives people nuts because a lot of agents out there and everybody runs their business how they want, that's great. We'll just go in and tell you your house is worth this before they've even seen it. To me, that's not really the right sequence of events. Obviously, I do research beforehand. We're prepared for comparables. I know the market, but every house is different. Every person's situation is yeah. different. You know, it's funny. We operate in two similar worlds, but we're very different because what we do when we do an appraisal is we're appraising, you know, hypothetical value. Like, what is the market prepared to pay? Like, yeah. the appraisal value is 400 based on the comps. Is it worth 450 now? Is that going to be the new comp that we're going to set? So, like, let's do that dance. In my world, when I'm telling people, you know, this is what I think market value is going to be, what's the disconnect with what people think about appraisal value? And when, say, agents get frustrated with numbers because, like, what are you basing your numbers on? Is it strictly comparable value? You, you raise a good point because I think what you're essentially describing there is you guys are at the head of the pack, but we, we feel we're at the head of the pack, too. Yeah. The, the, the comps we select, the reason I said most recent is because you got to stay recent because... What's recent? Like what, what is right the now, number, like right 90 now. days, 60 days, 30 days? Let, lenders actually have policies, for example, where they don't want us to go back beyond 90 days because market conditions can change that fast. Market conditions is essentially time. Yeah. And, and we keep hearing over and over again, it's very true, there is no supply in both the multifamily and the single, single family, family market, particularly yeah. in the entry level, sure. you know, under 700 jobs. It's bananas, yeah. And, and, and changes in, in price, this is a favorite line of mine, it's economics, supply and demand. Changes in price will not occur until you have changes in supply and demand, and the prices don't change until after that happens. But the bottom line with us is we've had three years in a row of this supply crunch. There's just no supply, mm -hmm. and it's huge demand. So can you forecast, I guess, more now than you would in, say, a stable market or a historical market where there's only been so much growth and you see a comp that sells 50000 over what the neighbor is selling for, you're almost expecting that a little bit now and gauging for that, where before it was that one sold for four, this one's worth four. You can understand a little bit more now than yeah. previously? Yeah, we'll bring, uh, we'll bring active listings into the equations more, okay. often, more often than not now, yeah. because what that is is, is what people are anticipating receiving in the market. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's changing so fast. Justin, you can actually you can actually find a set of sales that will support this number, and then you can take a couple of listings and the most current sales you can find that support a higher number. Interesting. So that's how fast time can change, and that's why we have to time adjust dated sales because we have to bring the dated price up to today's market conditions. So how do you do a time adjustment on a sale price? Technically, you're supposed to do what they call paired sales, and it would take you a year. You would never get anything done if you could actually do that. So okay. essentially what that means is you have to take your most dated sale, which would be November of last year, for example. 
and you have to find a highly similar home or the exact same home oh, that's resold today. We'll see the difference. All other things equal. Yeah. What's the change in the percentage increase? Really? Oh, that's, that's, that's your time adjustment. Well, there's a, there's a fun little hack that we do on the real estate side where we'll actually look at tax assessed value versus sale price, right? And there's a percentage number you get that can really show you trends in certain pockets and track that over a period of time. So like we'll get random calls from people saying, I bought this at this point in time, what's it worth now? And you can track year on year what that increase is and then match it versus the market rate. You'd be surprised where, you know, in our worlds when we look at the, how Prime does our analytics, if you find like three or four different ways to quantify a number, you usually feel pretty good about it, right? Yeah. So oh, yeah. you guys do like, the, you do the cost, like to rebuild approach, to comparison approach. Do you still do the three or is it still mainly the comparable approach that you're using? We primarily will do the, the direct comparison approach, which is that comparative sales. And we also do a cost approach. Uh, we don't, the cost approach is most applicable in a new construction. However, once a home ages, and depre it depreciates. depreciates in value. So the problem becomes measuring the depreciation. That's, that's very subjective. Yes. And, and, and I'll throw this out there because one of my former mentors, he's long gone now, but he used to say, Bob, the problem that people got to be careful with is valuation is very, very subjective. And, and all these new machines coming out to value, like automated valuation tools. It's crazy. How yeah. are they going to be subjective? I don't think artificial intelligence is necessarily going to make them subjective. Some are suggesting that, but I don't think so. It's we've very, we've seen it a whole number of times, right? Like if you look at the United States, everybody complains about sale data not being public in Canada, right? We have much different privacy concerns up here than they do in the States. Like I said, it's the Wild West. Um, what I advocate for is sold data being public to the consumer because it virtually is anyways. And I think it empowers everybody. But the problem with that is you get companies like Zillow in the States they're not a real estate company, right? You go to Zillow and type in your address to get a value of your home and it tells you it's worth five fifty. You could be underselling your home by a hundred thousand dollars, you could be overpricing your home by a hundred thousand dollars. The automated valuation tools he's talking about take your address, take what the Terranet system or the land registry system knows about your house and extrapolates this is what your house is worth based on the comps. You as a consumer, you take that information verbatim and say, Well, we don't even really need Bob or we don't need a real estate agent to come in and tell us what it's worth. You're missing the point because it is very subjective. So there's a lot of factors that go into a sale that you guys must like look at sometimes when you're looking at you know active listings where they've underpriced it by 20% and they get 60 to 70 thousand over asking. I just saw two in Oak Ridge. One was priced at 524, sold for 590. Now those was priced at 525, sold for 534. Two very different agents. I don't necessarily think their strategies were lined up one got a way better result than the other two fairly similar properties like does the name that's on the listing matter to you guys in terms of who you're dealing with or do you try and remain completely bought, like unbiased to that great question we 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 definitely try to remain unbiased we yeah. have, actually have to we have to remain unbiased mm -hmm. quite frankly <laughs> excuse me the you see that all the time and, and one of my favorite lines to people is because you'll have customers that you know, real estate's emotional. They get upset if they don't get the valuation that sure. they're anticipating from us. And I'll say, I'll say, Mr. Smith, for example, I'll say, unfortunately, I feel this is very well researched. It's an opinion at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. And I will follow up with, if, if you can provide me with anything else that suggests I'm wrong, I'd be more than happy to look at it. But you will see that one skewed sale, like you just talked about, that sold 50,000 over this. So what I try to do as the appraiser, Maybe I can find a couple of other highly similar homes that, that similar area, you know, similar like that. areas. You don't necessarily got to stay in the same area. Some are of similar market appeal. And maybe we're seeing that in other areas, the same thing. And it's the same product. Yeah. And you can say to the lender or the reader, it also sold 50,000 over it. And believe it or not, we're actually able to do that these days because there's so much of that happening. Yeah. There is the odd one though, where you will see that Justin and you can't support it. Because it's so far out there. It, it hasn't closed just, yet either. Like a sale's a sale. Just, and still closes, yeah, you right? just cannot get there. Yeah. And and, and ninety nine percent of the time when you throw that question back, well, if you can give me anything that suggests I'm wrong, you, 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 you never hear from. It's interesting, right? Being like we talked about this earlier at the beginning of the meeting. I'm not on this YouTube channel. You can go back to the Prime Mastermind Experience to see. But we were talking to Darcy, who's in the uh, chat earlier about adding secondary suites and getting good valuations on his appraisals. Now Darcy's an investor, right? Comes in, buys a single family homes, was adding secondary suites before it was even a thing in the market. 
but he was incredibly well prepared. Here's all my construction costs. Here's all the improvements I did. And he actually went to the, the extent of saying, well, here's some duplexes that are renting for the exact same amount that I'm renting this unit at. It's not really a single family home anymore. It's more of an income property. Here's what it would sell for if you had to sell it as a home with Grady Suite. Here's the duplexes. Yeah, and I mean, yeah. you got great valuations. Does that help you guys if somebody actually provides that? Because again, I'm just being honest here. Sometimes I think agents can feel that they're being pushy with the appraisers if they show up and they are like, well, here's why we think the value is this. This is what we want our number to be. Yeah. You never want it to be contentious. So like, yeah. how can we work best with people like you? Great question again. And what we're talking about here is cost and market value. Cost and market value are not necessarily synonymous. Those secondary dwelling units are a fantastic idea. You, they, you're, you're basically creating value through change in use. So those secondary dwelling units are applicable to areas that are zoned strictly residential. single family residential. So now you've, you've been able to bring in a secondary legal unit in an area that's all single family residential. That, that's valuable. Yeah. And that's, you're, you're creating value through change. Problem is some of the costs associated with doing so may not necessarily be attainable in the market. Some are, some aren't. And it's the same as real estate in general. We're seeing both sides of that. Sure. Um, the city, for example, their, their requirements to change that into a secondary are extensive. And I think yeah. you'll find most of the costs to complete those units are very, very dear and they're high. So once you get so, one that's done in an area and you have that as a comp, does that help the situation? If you turn Absolutely. around, there's an identical, hey, secondary, because we're seeing, <clears throat> we're seeing two types of people, people that are doing it well, like Darcy, people that are just going in, you know, throwing lipstick on a pig and saying, this is gonna be great. <laughs> and then all of a sudden it goes on the market and they drop the ball, you know, and then you really gotta understand what you're doing, like you said, and be diligent in your process, right? Yeah, you can't really lipstick these because the city yeah. is very stringent. Oh yeah. And, and I mean, I've, I've seen a bunch of these contracts that are they're expensive. Yeah, 70, <laughs> I think I've seen like 75 to 150, depending right. on what it's gonna be. Yeah. Um, you gotta understand that the numbers have to make sense, right? Yeah, you take a, a four level back, but with one I did recently, for example, and they made these homeowners literally pull out the whole bottom two levels re-insulate the whole ceiling wow. for separation, new drywall, fire separation. separation. They yeah. had to put in a new door to the outside, all kinds of stuff. So they hired Uncle Jimmy, the contractor, to do yeah, the work, yeah. and then they didn't look into the code. I mean, we see this, again, we do a very different type of business, right? Like, we could sell everything on the market if we wanted to because of the types of people we work with that have an appetite for investments. We shoot down a lot of deals because I walk into an investment property, I'm like, no, I'm not gonna sell this to you because yeah, it has a rental license, but guess what? London hasn't inspected every house with a rental license. And when yeah. you take new ownership, they're gonna send an inspector and that triplex is now a duplex and you lost a hundred grand, guess who you're calling, right? So I think doing good business long-term is better than just doing a lot of business short-term. And you've been doing this for 30 years. Like, yeah, I mean, fast. how's the, right? how's I the, just talked to you 30 years ago, like yes, I guess. It feels like it, <laughs> uh, you know, but I respect you a lot in the sense that, you know, I've called you on things and go ahead, let's uh, take a step back to something you said earlier. I want to touch on, you know, when you don't have comps, my entire listing career, I've gotten every random listing that doesn't have any comparables and people are like, well, this is what I want for it. How am I going to sell it? Um, actually, Lindsay called me. We all worked together on a file and credit in, and there wasn't a single comparable for a house that was renovated I there. Exactly, yeah. I remember that conversation you said, it's exactly what you said. I want you to expand on it. Like, yeah, there's no comps there. What other small towns have access to Lake Huron or are the same distance drive to Lake Huron, the same distance yeah. drive to the major metropolitan areas? It's actually not that complicated, right? Can you expand on that for the audience? Because I want them to understand that they can still do business in these towns. They just got to understand the process of yeah. pulling comps, right? I think the best, the simplest way to describe crazy to you is it's based on the most basic principle. It's the principle of substitution. Okay. So... And that's an economic principle too. There's many principles of valuation, but ideally you, you have to try, try to find something that offers highly similar utility or benefit. So if we're in a little town like Credit and, and they're all over the map, you know, you're gonna have to go to smaller rural communities, a similar proximity to something you deem to be desirable, like the lake, for example. Yeah. Um, and, and it, it's a common problem. We run into it, it's a, it's a hard thing. And the land values are different there too. Right? They are. They're a lot different than what you're going to find in the urban centers. And There's no land in the urban now. centers. That's why, the, again, the cost comparison approach we were talking about earlier is like the cost of land acquisition, actually building a property. We get that question a lot. And I'm like, 
tell people I'm like if you're not a builder don't even bother like people are always like I want to yeah. buy a lot and build a house and I'm like good luck because you're competing with people that do this for a living um you know what are your thoughts on that those things I'm still stuck in the, the rural thing. yeah the supply in rural too is not what you find in large urban centers similar no. to London yeah London's got all kinds of market activity where you get up in the boonies and the rural sits there's nothing out there. You're a year on market so, sometimes, yeah, right? So time time adjustments become important with those too. I don't know if Lindsay What's and it? I talked, touched on that, but can you break down a time adjustment for the audience? It's going back to the the resales. Are you fortunate? And you're not going to find typically resales in rural locations that have happened a year ago and today. If you do, you're very very fortunate. So you'll find one a year ago. But, and but what you do is you try to. It, it's back to that similarity thing. You try to find something that's highly similar. To the stuff you can sold and resold yeah. today and what was the difference in price all else equal and that's how you can kind of extract the time adjustment out of the market mm -hmm. and it, it, it's worked for me in the past let's it's let's pull it back to, and let's pull it back to metropolitan areas because you do the same thing here right where say you go to you know let's call it scott street in the east end of london and you go to like you know just off bond street two right. similar profiles of tenants two similar amounts of rent like if you have two triplexes that are both in both areas they're renting for similar amounts of money do, will you if you cannot find a direct comp in that area will you go out a little bit and out a little bit is it time that's more important or is it distance to the property that's more important time is just market conditions and market conditions that we can reiterate we, we have to adjust for time that's the first thing we do because okay. we're moving up in price daily that's right. once a sale occurs it's now deemed historical literally so first thing you do is time adjust now we try to find the best location. Location is the next adjustment. If you're out in the East End, you're asking me and you don't have anything in the East End, where do you go? That's a great question, right? So again, you have to, if you're coming into areas of superior market appeal, you'll probably see that reflected in the rents, number one. Mm -hmm. And you have to make a location adjustment. Yeah. And a lot of times it's, what's the land values? And you know, North and Northwest London, you might see, 4,500 to 5,000 front foot for an interior lot, for example, you're not going to command that same dollar necessarily in these stand and it might be 5% difference, 10%. So you make a 5% adjustment, adjustment on the price based on the difference in price. Okay. Potentially. But I got to tell you, like I'm finding nowadays, the investors are, are saying they don't really look at that as closely as they used to in the past. It's more of, you know, and, and we as appraisers are starting to break down sale prices into price per unit, yep. price per bedroom, particularly students. Sure. Uh, gross income multipliers, adjusted gross income multipliers. Yep. And ironically, the investors are looking at those numbers. And, and 30 years ago, when you and I were at Joe Pools, my best friend, we lived around the block from Joe Pools. Yeah. He says, oh, that thing sold for 10 times gross. That, that was the number. That's how you did it. That right? small income marketplace still tends to rely on that. It's a moot calculation. It's just the gross annual income divided, you know, sale price divided by gross annual income. It's a number. Yeah. It's a, it's a multiplier, right? It's, 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 a, funny. It's, a, it's a multiplier, but that small up to four unit marketplace Operation. relies on it. And it's amazing how efficient that marketplace is and how those numbers always tend to jive. And we will reconcile to those numbers in the multifamily market. We'll say, by the way, this price per unit range for the comparables we use, this gross income multiplier range for the comparables we use, and this price per unit all are bracketed by the number we've come up with. So we feel it's pretty well justified. And that's what takes all the time in our business is calculating all those numbers. And, and hence, going back to why I got in this business is a numbers thing, which I love. And you've seen, he's seen our spreadsheets in depth as well, right? We've gone back and forth on some appraisals and like, I honestly can't keep up here. It's way beyond me. Well, that, that's what I want to touch on, right? You guys, you know, again, too intelligent for me. you investors out there, keep in mind, right? Like when you're doing calculations and you're coming up with really comprehensive ways of analyzing properties, sometimes you're going, you know, too you're, far. you're too far, right? Like we've even talked about, and I understand the gross income multiplier is typically what will come back as a very important number for them. And it's a very basic way of calculating an investment return. But if they've got historical data over the last decade or 20 or 30 years saying, this is what we're using just to, to bracket our numbers and really make sure it passes this test. And if it's not there and it's falling outside of our confidence, well, that's something you're going to actually have to deal with. So understand what the appraisers are actually looking at when it comes to your properties, right? Because I think people can make assumptions of, well, it's worth this. I can sell it to somebody for this right now, but there's a disconnect understanding what appraisers are looking at 
Um, we did have one audience member question I'll jump into because I saw it asking like how recent does a comp have to be to be a valid comp? Yeah. Well, again, that would be today, you know, and, and when, we, when we're searching for comps, we're, we're actually looking for the best, most recent we can find. And unfortunately, if, if there's no supply and, and stuff's not moving, we, we might have to go back in time a little bit. And that's where the time adjustment's very critical, right? But if we, I don't know if I'm going too far here, but if, I, if I'm looking for sale, I want one now that occurred yeah. yesterday because that's forefront. That's at the head of sure. the marketplace, right? Um, when does it become invalid? And you said the banks want 90 days. The banks don't want you going and-, and uh, So is that the magic number, is it 90? Some are 120 days. They all, all, all the major lenders and the B lenders, they all have different policies with respect to that. Sure. But I think we could, you can say if we assume 90 days tends to be the norm. What are you seeing between A and B lenders right now? Because A, again, for clarity purposes, A lenders would be your banks, your larger institutions, higher, you know, risk adverseness. B lenders a little bit more creative sometimes. You know, they're I'll get calls on stuff where they're like, "What could you sell this for?" And they'll go, you know, 60, 40 or 70, 30 loan to value because they're like, yeah, you know, worst case scenario, I know we've got a good product. They know the people, they're a little bit more attached to the transaction. Like, I just would like to dig into that for a second, your thoughts on that. They're getting a little fussier. They, you know, I'll tend to put in a dated sale in a, in a limited marketplace where you don't have the market data, like go to the rural, for example. Sure. And, and you'll say, You'll put in that standard comment for the lender saying, you know, due to lack of sales, we've expanded our horizons, we had to broaden our horizons and take more dated sales. And they'll still come back, if I only put in three sales, they'll come back and say, no, we want two more because they're too old. You and can't make them up. You, like, you I don't see it that way. Yeah, so, okay, so you want, you'd prefer I put something else in that's not comparable, yeah. and then you're going to come back to me and say, well, the adjustment percentages are out of range because you had to make so many adjustments, which yeah. means essentially it's not comparable. That's an interesting thing. And then, and then you, you don't meet the requirements for your adjustment percentages. So, end of the day, they're they're adapting with us here. Yeah. And, and everything, nothing remains constant. Things are always changing. And the lenders are starting to see some of these problems that we're having. Sure. Not only with lack of supply and lack of sales, which it seems to be starting to change. I don't know what you think about this, sales, but it seems like the sales are starting to come back more now. Volume wise, yeah, for sure. Like what yeah. we noticed was, and then we talked about this last time, was we had about you know 30 days of a massive volume drop. I'm, I'm big on, I do not like the news. I don't like how they just clickbait. They're in the business of getting you to just look at the article versus actually doing reporting or like looking into what they're saying. And the headlines were real estate drops 50%. What does that really mean? We've talked about that. It was just volume because we're all sitting at home. We're not actually doing anything. They're not listening to properties. The sales aren't actually happening. Guys like him and I are getting caught up on paperwork, finding new ways to actually do business. And then now we're busier than we've ever been. So we actually tracked our numbers. We grew significantly from the beginning of COVID to where we're at now. And I've talked to the entire team about it. Like we are in our spring, summer season. There's no end in sight. Yeah. We're busier than we've ever been. So I anticipate we'll have a record month next month. I, I agree with you hundred percent. And uh, we talked about this briefly, you know, the three of us earlier, yeah. we, were, we were literally to a T, we were down 30% our volume two months ago. Mm. Last month we were down 20%. This month to date, we're way ahead. I mean, count the percentage because I don't have time, yeah. <laughs> but it's, it's booming now and, and it's, it's everything. It's, you know, we have a project, actually we're in a Domus building right now. Domus, one of the best builders in the city, so all around us. Um, we launched a project in Port Stanley in the 350s. Actually, we pitched it to you guys as a good investment opportunity for phase one for the semis. Pretty much sold out. I think there's like one or two units left, which are pretty much accounted for. Um, we already increased the pricing for Monday. We're 45 days ahead on that project, right? Yeah, and, isn't that interesting? And bananas and the single families, which are going to be in the mid 600s. Like I'm looking at the numbers and I'm like, are we priced too low? In the mid 600s in Port Stanley, right? And, and that's a demand thing, right? Yeah. So you, you're you're starting to adjust to that demand, yeah. Because and now now we're seeing that we reiterated earlier. Now the price might change as a result of that. Right? Literally, it was overnight. Yeah. Like I was talking to the developer yesterday, and like I like prices to stay as affordable as possible. They were super dialed in on phase one of the semis when we did the price increase for Monday. I was talking to Mike about it. It made sense, right? Like the people that all bought phase one, they've already got a $5,000 appreciation on their purchase and nothing's even happened on the site yet. And they're gonna see two more increases. So I told this to the membership when we sent it out, there's two $15,000 bumps coming on those units. They're 300 and let's call it $60,000 units. Truthfully, they're like four, four $25,000 units. They're just priced 
aggressively now because you're buying off the plan. But I think the demand truly was proven. Mike was being super conscious about it and being a good operator saying, you know, let's not just assume everything's going to sell out and be good builders, build good quality product. Now we're, we're ahead of the curve and the demand for the single families out there, it's showing the dynamics of the market are changing because people, again, from a, a cost acquisition perspective, those 650 houses out there are 900 in London now. Yeah, and yeah. guys like you and I have looked at that and been like, man, I could have bought that seven hundred thousand dollar house for three fifty in Foxfield like seven years ago. What's happening? But yeah. you know, I think sometimes people can get stuck in their own little bubble, thinking there's no way this is going to continue to increase. You know, let's go back. Is this a COVID nineteen thing? Yeah, maybe. <laughs> yeah, their bubbles. Is this, I guess. A, is this a demand for for moving to the lake? <laughs> I, you know what? I do think home ownership and understanding that, like, you know putting more stock into your house matters more than it ever did before yeah. because people are spending more time at home. People travel, you know, I, I said that to Shannon, like we didn't even appreciate our house over the last three years because we work so much and just we're always out and about. Like we're spending more time playing there with our daughter and, and just enjoying yeah. our property. So I think you are seeing people figuring out what, how they like to live yeah. and then just getting set up a little bit better in yeah. their properties, yeah. right? Well, we see that more just as much as you guys, I'm assuming, as the Frasers, because it's so interesting to see people at home. Yeah. You know, all of a sudden you're driving around, the cars are gone, and all the cars are in the driveways. Everybody's zooming. Everybody's, you know, home with their families, which they had to be, which is amazing. Yeah. And, and like I say, we had to adapt to that earlier, too, because now we have to conduct interviews at the door rather than disturb their family. But it was, it was nice to see the family there. I, I think it's yeah. there's going to be good that comes out of it from the standpoint of like I've spent more time with my wife and daughter than I have probably in the last two years on a regular yeah, basis. Sure. We have a better routine. I have friends that I work with that we're all crazy busy because of how we operate our businesses. Yeah. You know, we're we're spending more time talking on the phone, checking in with each other. I think the community is going to be stronger at the end of the day if you can be thoughtful about how you adapt. But I guess that's a kind of a good way to wrap up this conversation of how. You know, everybody is adapting, right? I really want to do a deep dive into how this guy's mind works and we'll get into a couple questions for the audience That's right now. That's a scary now. place. Um, <laughs> but the reason I brought him in is he's always adapted, right? Like he's my one of my go-to guys that I'll always call. Bob, this is, what, this is what's happening, what do you think? I don't call him because I'm like, hey Bob, can you just give me this number and I'm just trying to get the sale done. I'm not that greasy salesman. It, I respect him, right? Like, And, and it's mutual respect, Justin, because because my team, I instruct them to call realtors all the time, including yourself, and, and ask them how the market reacted. Because what you guys see is how the market reacts. We don't see that. Sure. We just see numbers on paper. So it's, it's, it's so valuable for us. Getting back to subjectiveness, I think you got to know how the market's anticipating, how the market's acting. And, and we can only get that from people like you. So we thank you for that. It's, real estate is art and math. I've said this a thousand times, right? It is one of those things that like, Perception. By the way, this is my favorite line. Yeah. I remember in the old days, it's always location, 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 right? That's all people say. A real estate is just location. Perception is becoming huge, right? People, how they perceive things. Yeah. You know, you know, it used to be Yuffie was a problem. Now it's mold. Mold is the new Yuffie type of thing. Asbestos tape on a furnace will kill a deal if you don't understand what you're looking correct. at, right? And the cost of removal is not cheap, right? So people perceive these things and how does that influence value? We have to be cognizant of all that stuff. Take, take a school. People won't buy a house because it's right near school, but then they realize like- I'm surprised that we're still this smart after having worked at Cools. Yeah, it's, it's cause effect. Well, I actually say, I'm like, we survived Cools and uh, gym bombs. I'm like, I, that's probably why I'm making yeah. COVID okay. But, um, you know, the other thing I was gonna say on that was perception wise, like I've seen people with, you know, looking at a house that backs onto a school. Yeah. I'm thinking, oh, I don't wanna buy that. It's just gonna be loud. There's gonna be kids running around. I'm like, well, kids are in school typically in like fall and winter when you're not really gonna be in your backyard anyways. Yeah. And then the summer they're out when you're typically gonna be in your backyard. So, you know, you wanna rely on people and a team to kind of help you with the process. Um, RJ Lyons appraisals, if you guys ever need direct appraisals, say you're not doing a transaction that's through real estate and wanna know value, reach out to them directly. You can find them online. We'll have all their links in the replay as well too. Bob is an absolute beast. Um, you know, and when we can go back and really spend time, I know we'll be at the Run Club patio hanging out like we <laughs> always do. Um, Lindsay, do you want to fire us some of the questions and then I'll reiterate them? Awesome. Yeah. So we're getting a lot of questions on multifamily. Obviously, we're sure. dealing with investors. Yeah. So um, our first question is um, with five plus units. So when we get into commercial multifamily residential, yeah. um, what... 
what are the differences between that and single residential yeah. or like maybe your one to four units? So uh, did you guys hear that question? I want to make sure it was clear. Lindsay was saying, you know, what's the disconnect or what's the difference between larger commercial multifamily and under four units? How do they look at it? And I think Bob can definitely dig into that for us. Yeah, that's a good question. And unfortunately, my designation as an appraiser is CRA. And there's there's two appraisal designations under my governing body, the appraisers of Canada, that's the CRA designation. And we're only qualified to appraise single family homes and multifamily up to four units. So getting beyond four units, I'm not allowed to get into or I, I'm not schooled in. But what I can tell you from the past is, you get into six, seven, eight, nine units, all I can tell you is from the people I've learned under and was schooled by, property tax becomes more of an issue when you get into those because they're taxed differently than the under four units. So that's-, that's Different appraisers get, for different types of product. That's something to keep in mind. Different types of real estate agents for different types of products. Too. Yeah, yeah. And, and the people that do the above four units, which are five units and above, literally to a apartment high rises, they will get into looking at analyzing the property tax expense more. They'll get into doing what they call adjusted gross income multipliers, which will literally back out who's responsible for utilities only and then readjust that GIM we talked about earlier. And that's that's probably a more, not a bad way to go in the small income marketplace too, is, is backing those out. Now it's a level playing field, literally, because mm -hmm. now the utilities are out of the equation. What is that multiplier number? Um, and again, you're going and, back to like a macro thing, gross rent multiplier that but, you look at that a lot of you guys aren't even using because you just think it's too basic of a calculation, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, and then they get in and they will rely more heavily on cap rates, which we don't get into as much as they do as, as mm. like mm -hmm. the cap rate is everybody's and, and just big point, big Justin, point. Yeah. Just is making me feel dumb because you know, say, where's the cap rate? And, but that's more applicable to the above four units there because that small income market doesn't necessarily get that carry. It's, it's, it's particularly a duplex because I, I'm going to buy a duplex and I'm going to have you live there, my buddy, because I just want you to help me pay the mortgage. Keep so, that in mind, right? Right. So there's, but property tax was what I recall was a big, a big factor when you get over four units because the tax wow. treatment is entirely different apparently yeah. when you get into, you know, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. 12. Yeah. I, I was going to say, sorry, Lindsay, um, cap rates. So a lot of you guys will do cap rate calculations on small multifamily and then just ask what the cap rate sold for. Even we don't necessarily always look at the cap rate. We look at what the rents are, what the rents could be, what it's sold for, and what your NOI, your net operating income, or how much money you made on it's gonna be. I know the cap rate is a calculation NOI by purchase price. These guys don't even apply it, right? So yeah. we'll talk about it, but it's not what they're actually gonna to use to do the valuation at the end of the day, right? Yeah, and you're actually not wrong to do it. Yeah. By rights, I think we should all do it. I think, I think it makes more sense, to be honest with you. And maybe one day the appraisal of Canada will mandate we do it because I think that really, in my opinion, I think you should be looking at that. The hard part is, and especially in the commercial well, space, that, that multiplier works. And, multiplier and the is consistent, right? Is efficient. Yeah. And the other problem is, like when you get into NOIs, and we see this a lot, we do a lot of vetting of our deals. There's a lot of made up numbers that we deal with, right? Like a lot of times, the, the utilities, the expenses aren't necessarily accurate, which is why they're stripping it down to what's the gross rent multiplier because we know. This guy sold or has cooked his books to make it look good to get the sale price, and then they got the property. Everything was completely different, which happens, right? Yeah, and I would suggest to you, if, if I'm a purchaser, and, and I'm just throwing this out there, if I can create a unit of comparison for you that's believable and at least something I can relate to rather yep. than just a bunch of adjustments from an appraisal's perspective and a number, if I can give you several units of comparison that you can relate to, or yep. that becomes a common denominator, maybe that would help everybody. This is the gross income multiplier range. This is the sale price per unit range. Yeah. This is the price per bed, you know, the uh, GIM range. And then, and then, by the way, the subject purchase price of X represents a gross income multiplier of this, a price per unit of this, a price per bed of this. Oh, guess what? It's bracketed by the comps we just pulled on those unit basis. Then we're not even looking at it, because we're just looking at the price of those unit of comparisons we can relate to that are believable, which we which are also what we rely on and in the market. We operate the same way. So like when we're stripping down a property, we're trying to kill the deal. We're trying to find ways to kill it the whole way yeah. along. If it survives, great. Gross income multiplier, but then you look for confirmation through your other valuation ranges. And a lot of times they'll come back and fall within a certain level of confidence. So you know that you've got something good. Lindsay, did you have a follow up on that as well? Yeah, so one of the other questions and it kind of falls right in line here is, so for one to four units, um, 
is it mostly based on comps then? Like how much of a role does rent play into that? Or is it comparable rents in those properties like a fourplex, what they're getting for rent and what your fourplex you're appraising would be? Yeah, yeah that's a great question, Lindsay. And it's a, it's a good follow up question because you're, you're gonna see in the multifamily market too, where rents are, we, we will take more than one sale because it, again, you're gonna find the odd sale or two sales where the rents are really, really low. But when you analyze it further, you find out from the owner of those properties that, that hey, that's Justin and his brother Joel. They've been living in my house for 25 huh. years. And you know what? And then Lin Lindsay wants to buy it and then re-rent it for a higher I'm, number. <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna accept a lower rent yeah. in exchange for long-term tenancy, and I know they're gonna take care of the place. So I'm not opposed to taking a lesser rent because I know I got a good tenant. So we do see that in the market too, and we gotta be cognizant of that. That's why we put in four or five sales typically sometimes in multifamily because you'll see from an income perspective, sometimes that's skewed, which is another reason we create several units of comparison, right? Because if you can create several and they're all in line, that's the perfect scenario. How do you get an easygoing guy like this that is so <laughs> intelligent? I, honestly, it's funny, like I know you, I don't know. but every time we talk, I always say like, you know, the skilled, talented people are the ones that are kind of even keeled, right? They know what they know because they've done it. I really, you know, I do value experience. I think, again, coming out of COVID, one of the best things we're gonna see is people that have talent, experience, really craftsmen in what they do. Yeah. I equate you to somebody literally, like you talk about, you know, a, a coffee roaster, a cobbler, an artist, or somebody that does what they do. Like, I always go back to it in every episode of Prime People We Shoot. There's an artistry to what you do. Sure. And yeah. it, I'm sure you enjoy that part of it of being like, yeah. you know, you get a creative problem to solve and the hard ones are the ones that, you know, when you're done, Shane, we just killed the hardest deal of our life yeah. yesterday, finally firmed up. And it's the best feeling in the world when you actually get the job done, right? Oh, it is, it is. It, and we want to do a good job for people. Yeah. And, 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 and I'll reiterate, like, us talking to you guys is super important now because now we have a perception and, and those perceptions are driving prices too, right? Like, and, and we have to, that's how you stay ahead of the curve too. Sometimes we will put in a listing as a six or seven sale to show what people are anticipating in the market. And maybe we'll copy a unit based on the list price. Okay. And stuff is moving so quack or quick. We've actually found a single family market where if you rely on those old dated sales and then two of the active listings sell at a higher price that you could have used today and you were wrong by a substantial amount, then you're gonna have egg on your face. So we really tend to look at what's listed too because that's what people are anticipating. And that's really the head of the curve. Doesn't mm -hmm. mean they'll get it, but we look at it. One thing that I find really weird about our industry, in the States, when I talk to agents in the States and they have a financing condition, they will not waive financing before the appraiser has been through. In our world, we have a financing condition, they're cleared by the bank, waive financing, and then the appraiser goes through. And like, you hope there's not a problem, we always try and get them through first. Like we always try to ask for enough time. It's a super competitive market. So we educate our clients as to the risks and everything else. Why do you think that is? Like, why don't they send in the appraisers within the financing period? I just, I don't really understand that. This is such a great question. That, and I, I've been asked this for 30 years and I'm, no, see, I'm not that smart because I've never gotten the answer. <laughs> it's, not, you know, it's, it's like the marketplace. But, but I just really, what, what, what happens if we do come back at the end of the day when it's closing tomorrow and we say the value is not there? I, I don't get that. I don't okay. know. If, is the lender on the hook now? Because that's the buyer's on the hook. Somebody's on the hook. Well, the buyer's on the hook. So essentially, like, so say you buy a four hundred thousand dollar house, yeah. and you buy it for four twenty five, and the agent's like, yeah, yeah, just buy it. It's great. It's going to appraise, no problem. And then you go to appraise it a week before closing, and they're like, no, it's worth four. The buyer's got to come up with twenty five k. You don't have twenty five k. You can't close. And again, this goes back to what he said earlier too. Where quite often, I'll see values on a property that sell for so high. And I'm like, oh no, that's not gonna close. And they're like, what do you mean? Like, I'll go into multiples against other people and I'll win at a lower price for my client because I'll say like, yeah, yeah, no, that, my client's actually a cash buyer. You're a cash buyer that's coming in firm at $590,000. What if they appraise at 550? Do they have 40 to cover that? Because they're not actually cash buyers. A cash buyer is somebody with a briefcase of cash that can close and has 590 grand. Somebody that's going to get a mortgage still needs to get a mortgage. And a lot of times their agents aren't even educated on that kind of sequence of yeah. events and it's super risky. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, the, I think the banks are so busy now that I, they, they've got one person doing what 
formerly three and four people did. It's very true. And, and I think they, they yeah. forget. Yeah. In all honesty, I, I think they leave these appraisals that were supposed to order when the house sold and the agreement of first to sale was signed. Yeah. And it gets pushed aside. And then the border, you know, a lot of a lot of stress on their end because now they got to get the, the appraisal in to justify the mortgage and the purchase price. And yeah, I don't. It's a great question, and honestly, There's I no promise answer. I'm going to get the answer. There's no time. answer. I told him I was going to stump him today, um, but there is no answer because it's it's a standard practice in the it industry, and there is none. Yeah, I, I, that's my advice to you guys out there. A lot, especially if there's agents watching this um, for your business. You know, I'll give you guys a little secret of what we do at Prime. Our admin actually has a reminder in her calendar on every single deal, touch space with the lender, touch base with the lawyer, remind them that we have to do the appraisals, remind them that the file's closing, because even lawyers forget deals are closing. It happens all the time. People are just busy, right? You gotta take ownership of your own deals. You need to talk to your lender. You need to talk to your lawyer. This is a big transaction. So like, don't even expect your agent to do it. If you're working with them, one that does it, that's great. But assume everybody's gonna drop the ball and then you'll be prepared, worst case scenario. Um, do we have any more questions, Lindsay? We do, yes. So um, going back to kind of what we talked about in the intro, um, what updates are the best or most effective updates that affect the appraisal positively? Yeah, and this is a great question. And I, I frankly, I get this on the job all the time. I'll, I'll have, you know, uh, Consumers, they'll say to me, Bob, what should I do? Like, what, what kind of return am I going to get on this if I do that? And it's it's really not rocket science in this regard. Any trade magazine you read or, you know, home magazines, for example, the highest return on investment for single family residential has always been the kitchen and bathroom. Right? There you go. Always. And, and yeah. they actually Lindsay's did, like got her hands up in the yeah, air. Yeah, <laughs> they actually did a survey. They basically in Canada used to have a website. They used to have a thing called Renova where they interviewed old guys like myself that have been in the business forever and were designated members of the appraisal of Canada. What, what are estimates from what we've seen in the market and how the market reacts and what they pay for renovations? And kitchens were like 75 to 125%. So they're basically saying you're gonna get every dollar back. Bathrooms, same thing, 75 to 125. And, I run, and, the, and the next thing, which is interesting, I'm sure you guys appreciate, was painting. Mm -hmm. Painting was huge. Massive. I've actually, one recent one that I've popped up, I've noticed a couple times lately is landscaping. All of a sudden, like yeah. I, I, in the last year, like exterior landscaping, you know, I have clients call me and say, I got to put in a $90,000 pool and do all this money. That's great for you. I'm like, keep in mind, you're not adding a ton of value. You may get 30% back on that. Yeah. Um, but it's, you know, the exterior landscape and enjoyment, maybe because of what's happening right now, people are, you know, I, buyers that never wanted a pool all of a sudden they want a pool. It's a very different kind of marketplace that way, right? I, I guess you know, yeah. somebody yeah. calls you and says, hey, Bob, I'm gonna paint my house gold. Probably not gonna add a lot of value on the outside, right? Be careful. Yeah. <laughs> Don't do it. Yeah, yeah, and he's going like this in the background. That's what they would not consider to be neutral. <laughs> yeah, it's, you know what? And this again, like I was talking to a luxury home buyer yesterday. I actually wanna meet them at 1.30 today um, and discussing the build process. And I told them, they're like, well, we wanna buy the lot and build ourselves. I'm like, that's great. I'm like, I've done it probably won't do it again, hire a professional, honestly, because the time it cost me to go through and do that process from like the land acquisition to the actual consulting, architectural engineering to the design component of it. Yes, I understand everybody likes HGTV, everybody likes design, you wanna pick everything yourself, you can still do that if you hire a professional designer. They're just, their job is to go out and source the best materials possible, put it together in a palette that works, and then actually get you the best cost. So you may spend 100 grand on a good builder and a good designer, but it may save you 200 on the actual build cost. You just need to think differently. And it's kind of the same in the appraisal world where, you know, you want to work with somebody who knows what they're doing rather than yeah. Uncle Jimmy, the appraiser, right? Yeah, absolutely. I, and I'm still, I still got landscaping in my head, what you were discussing there. Yeah. There, there still is that dynamic out there, cottage in the city. Nobody can afford the cottages. They can in Port Stanley, but that's COVID-19 as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> or Grand Bend, sorry. Right, but Grand Bend. The, the whole market's shifting. It's, it's crazy. crazy. Yeah, we, we could talk an hour about that, but, but yeah. It's... But landscaping, and it, it, it follows that trend of bring indoors, outdoors, outside, outside in, and people are trying to open their homes to the backyards, for example, and, uh, you know, lakefront in particular is very, very expensive. Not everybody can afford it, so. World is so definitely they, changing. Yeah, if you can create cottage in the city, that's not a bad gig at all. So, so just to wrap it up, those, those things are hard to value. Like, they are. You, you know, pools the classic one on, on an immediate return. And what yeah. I always say to people is, you're going to spend fifty thousand on the pool and the pool decking and a few bells and whistles to go along with it. Or if you had to sell tomorrow, are you going to get your fifty thousand? Absolutely not. 
there's a very good chance you, you won't. Unless, you gotta understand you're that. you're really right? lucky, right? And we've seen it in the resale market. Yeah. Those are the ones people in the market, maybe you guys could attest to this a bit, wouldn't pay full pot for if it was bought tomorrow, right? Or, you know, because you, again, you're looking at values around you and it may not necessarily be supportable at that $50,000 price tag. Well, put, put a number on it, right? Like I was talking to a pool contractor the other day. He said 45 grand is what it costs for a pool of three feet of concrete right now. You're probably adding another 20 grand, so you're 65 in. By the time you build a pool house and really blow the doors out through and lighting, let's call it 90. Now you're at a price point of home that's like the six to 700, and probably 700 to 900, to be honest with you. And then the average days on market of that price point is very different than the house that's selling for 300 to 500 that's getting 15 offers and selling 100 over asking price. So, you know, you got to understand what you're getting into, but also understand if you're in a house and you're going to be in it for 10 years, go for it. Yeah. Like if, if you're going to enjoy that yeah. improvement over a 10 year period of time, there's a, a tangible value to that versus you spending $3,000 a season just to get somewhere that you can go swimming, right? Like, yeah, you read my mind there. Actually. Yeah. That's scary because I, I just uh, always say to people too, I says, because they're upset when you tell them people don't like to hear they're going to spend 90 100 grand and not get it back immediately i said but what you're forgetting is you're not measuring the economic utility of use going forward that you're going to get out of it and that's worth to you a fortune because now you've got your cottage oh too, right? my best thing so when we're talking to investors when we're appraising your properties and you say you bought it for x and you're selling it for x so often people are just bullish on price because maybe they're not getting as much as they want to get or i'm not going to give it away for that i'm only making x but they're forgetting about the 10 years of principal pay down that their tenant paid off their mortgage that now they have an extra 150k sitting there so they're saving you know cents but giving up dollars it's kind of the same thing in this world where you can be so worried about what you're spending but you're actually spending more on other things you just got to be thoughtful about your deployment of resources i think at the end of the day i'm gonna leave you with a funny story along the same lines but when i first started back in 1988 this i always remember this because it was hilarious to me when i was sitting in an office and you know this this couple came in to talk to my mentor at the time and uh, they had two sets of plans in their arms and this was a high high-end executive level home, all kinds of landscaping site improvements and they literally spent an hour with, I'm not gonna name names, but he was my mentor, and uh, with this gentleman, and uh, they said, so, so Mr. Smith, what do you think, should we do it? And they, they're really excited, and they have their heart and soul into these plans. They spent like a year with an architect to design them, and, and the response was, and I was, you know. Fly on the wall. Fly on the wall, ears yeah. per, what's the answer, what's the answer, what's the answer? The answer was hysterical, was, well, are you going to be happy? And they said, what? He <laughs> says, are you going to be happy? Well, yeah, we'll do it. Because you're not going to get your money back. <laughs> and that cost him $500 or something to die for the console. <laughs> yeah, I, I didn't imagine so. But then he went into a little more detail. And he says, you know what? This is huge. But the problem is, is you're, you're designing it to what you like. To a T, yeah. that may not appeal to the broad marketplace. When you get a little high, high end home, some of them are kind of eccentric too, right? You're gonna like I've got one for sale right now in Dorchester, three point two five million, which is you know that's big dollars, big yeah. dollars, right? Especially for our market, but it's not really like if you look at it's a hundred acres, it's got three private lakes, it's fifty five hundred square foot home, accessory building with another residential unit. Go to our website; yeah. it's awesome. Um, <laughs> but it's a good deal if you look at that house and you dropped it into the GTA and like ten years ago. 15 years ago, yeah. it's probably 3.25 million. Drop it there now, it's probably $15 million. Yeah. Right? So again, you can build something or do something for today and lose sight of where it could be and if you're gonna enjoy that property. But this is also something where somebody could buy that property, love it as is, somebody could just as likely buy that property and dump a quarter million into it. They were yeah. into the property for 3.5, they're into it for let's say 10 years, and then somebody comes along and says, yeah, I'll pay you seven for that. Like. That happens with those types of properties. We sell very unique luxury properties, so it's I know limited market, it, it's it's a limited marketplace. But the people that play in that marketplace have the ability to do what they want. So, like when I, yeah. I had one, they're not afraid to go in because they got deep pockets and they can. Yeah, I got I did one in Grand Bend. It was one point five at the time. I went into the property. It was unreal. The guy bought it cash. Like we were there for nine hours. One point five million bought the thing. Free and clear. Wow. Two point five yeah. now. Yeah. I'm talking to like 1% of the marketplace, but there's another guy out there that would absolutely love to love live in paradise that has the ability to come in and pay cash for that type of property and then spend another 150. So it's like, it's, it's literally 
I equate it to, you know, they talk about Michael Jordan. I just watched that documentary on Netflix. It was <laughs> phenomenal. I heard that's good. I, my son told me. Phenomenal that. documentary. Really gives you an idea of kind of how this guy's wired. And, you know, they talk about he had a big gambling thing where he'd go in and he'd always bet. He'd be on the golf course betting 10, 50, 20,000. Like, and people were like, you have a gambling problem. And the guy that was gambling with him, that, like his partner on the course was like, well, you got to put it in perspective. Him dropping 10 grand on a course on a, a putt? is the equivalent of you dropping $20. Yeah, It's kind of the same thing in the real estate world, but the big thing is when you talk big price points, the buyer demand pool drops significantly. So if I'm selling a $30 million apartment complex, there's maybe four people that I'm calling for that. If I'm yeah. selling a $250,000 duplex, it's probably 756 people I can send that to, right? So. Yeah. Yeah, it's a neat dynamic. It, sure. it is. Our world is a lot of fun. I hope you guys got a lot of value from Bob. He's, uh, oh. Oh, there's another question. Wonder about the updates inside of the home. If you were doing quartz countertops versus laminate, would that affect the value of appraisal when refinancing versus sell? Yeah, it doesn't matter if it's a refi or a sell. It's, it, it's going to help you. Yeah, because you're improving your kitchen, right? So you're, you're going to a premium product and, and you're spending the money in the right place. So absolutely that would help. It's got to match the area though, right? So if you're putting like yeah, marble countertops in an area it's, that does not have a single marble countertop in an area, it's, it's going to limit your yeah. upside. So don't over improve kind of what we were talking about before. Great point. Bob, I want, I want to give you our platform more than anything. I appreciate your time. Like, My pleasure. We're going to definitely go catch up um, at some point after this in the summer, maybe go golfing. Or Absolutely, yeah. Um, you know, if I gave you the platform, you know, irregardless of business and appraisals and everything else, you just wanted to give one message to the audience from a personal level saying, you know, just anything you wanted, what would that be? If you could have a billboard right now, what would you write on that billboard? Stay safe. Yeah. It's going to get better. Yeah. A hundred percent. And it's, it's all about community, right? Like yeah. I said, you got people coming together and finding new ways of doing things and we appreciate your time. My pleasure. I would shake thanks, your hand, thanks, but I'm not thanks, I know. <laughs> <laughs> thanks a lot for having me. Thank you. Guys,